Uh, so thank you so much again for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, I am Maria McQuaid. I am the healthcare program associate at Tannenbaum. Uh, Tannenbaum is a secular, non-sectarian, non-profit organization dedicated to combating religious prejudice in the spaces where people live their lives. Um, so for us, uh, we have four key program areas. Uh, we have a workplace program, which, which, which works with multinational corporations to create more inclusive policy uh, for employees. We have our peace building program, which works uh, with religiously motivated peace builders in active and post-conflict zones. Uh, our healthcare program, which is hosting the webinar series today, uh, works with hospitals and medical education programs um, to make sure that the religious and cultural needs of patients are addressed and met. And then we have our education program, uh, which works with teachers K through 12 uh, to create more inclusive spaces uh, for students of different religious and cultural backgrounds. Uh, so Tannenbaum's mission is to promote justice and build respect for religious difference by transforming individuals and institutions to reduce prejudice, hatred, and violence. In healthcare, that means respecting patients' beliefs and practices as it relates to their care. Therefore, the healthcare, missions pro the healthcare program's mission is to ensure that patients of all religious beliefs and none receive religio-culturally competent care. Uh, so I am joined by two distinguished speakers today. Uh, Lima Marcus, an oncology nurse practitioner and adjunct professor at Hunter College and public health advocate, and Dr. Jasper Singh, who specializes in pulmonary medicine at Atrium Health in North Carolina and is a member of the executive team for the North American Sikh Medical and Dental Association. Um, and they were both nice enough to join us today to share a little bit about their experiences um, and kind of their knowledge about vaccination and religious beliefs in uh, their specific religious communities. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship to religion and how it impacts the work that you do? I'll defer to the doctor and I'll, I can go after him. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, no titles here. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm just following uh, from the, on behalf of the, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the North American Sick Medical and Dental Association today. Um, not my parent organization, uh, which I in which I practice. Um, so I just want to say, uh, religion for me, um, how it affects the vaccination aspects, is honestly for the religious background of six. Six basically serve to serve others. You live your life in the service of humanity. You live your life in the service of other people, and your inward mission, your spiritual mission, is actually focused on eliminating your own ego. So the idea that your own, the ego, the, the I-ness, and you might say the, the capital I in this world is something to be overcome. And so for six, the idea of um, vaccination to us is relatively straightforward for the majority of people. Exemptions are rare um, and maybe have to do with specific health issues as such per se, but those are rare as a generality. Um, and if I make a generalization, I would say that most six would say that would support vaccination for a number of reasons. One is a public health measure. Two, there's a lot of trust in the scientific community uh, and the Sikh religion. And then the third aspect is more of a social aspect, which is the, the Indian subcontinent was devastated. The majority of Indians, the more, majority of Sikhs are in the, from the Indian subcontinent. And so from that perspective, they've seen firsthand the suffering early on in the pandemic, many phases. And so there's a bit of fear element too as well. So from the religious perspective though, Sikhs are very comfortable with vaccination. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I liked hearing about that. When it comes to Judaism, uh, the way the way we look at Judaism is a belief in one God and uh, following his commandments, which guide us in uh, living morally with one another um, and in service of God. And when it comes to public health vaccination or uh, any kind of health issue or life and death issue, while there are many hundreds of laws and commandments in Judaism, we're obligated to abandon all of them to save any lives. So uh, life-saving measures are first and foremost, um, and our law book constantly says that we need to live with the laws and not die by the laws, which simply gives us license to do a lot of things in the service of health and um, saving lives, helping others who are very ill. Uh, that being said, 
there are centuries of responsa written by rabbis as far back as the 15, 1600s when inoculation and variolation began, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, smallpox and other diseases that were ravaging communities. And they all unequivocally state that we're required to vaccinate and take any steps necessary that would uh, save your life, save the lives of your community. Um, there are laws going back to thousands of years advising people to leave communities that have a plague there, you know, flee for your life leave your community. Uh, some people have pointed out that that's not a good idea because if you're infected, you're now uh, sharing it. But what, what that goes back to say is simply um, don't live your life during a pandemic or during an unsafe time as though nothing's happening. You know, you need to be proactive. And, you know, we do have hundreds of years of tradition that teach us that. So for the most part, Judaism is absolutely in support of vaccination. Um, we also follow the majority when it comes to religious law, but we're also told to follow the majority when it comes to medicine. So for all of those reasons, um, mainstream Orthodox, uh, mainstream Judaism and all of its denominations do vaccinate. That being said, there has been a very strong anti-vaccine component and group within Jewish communities that have been growing and they're fed by the mainstream uh, secular anti-vaccine groups. And they've managed to get a really strong grip on a lot of Jewish communities. Uh, sometimes they're mostly stronger in the very insular and ultra-religious communities who maybe have uh, lower education rates, less science education, uh, less access to good sources if they need to refute it. So it has become challenging as the pandemic has dragged on and on. You know, like Dr. Singh mentioned, that a lot of Sikh were um, kind of triggered by fear because of what happened on the Indian subcontinent in March 2020 when the pandemic first hit New York City where I'm from and where I live and where a lot of religious Jewish people live we took a very large hit and hundreds of people died in the first few weeks but as the pandemic has lengthened there's a little more amnesia people are more jaded they're losing more trust in public health and in the discourse so it's been challenging that's very eloquent. Absolutely. I want to sort of add to that. That's okay with you. That's a that would I would say similar challenges are amongst the Sikh religious populations, especially what you kind of hinted at, which is the idea of those people in which who, in who've kind of forgotten the earlier phases of the suffering that was inflicted. Um, I'd be curious about your aspect of what Israel's going through, but that we'll get to that part later. Um, that's been a very interesting international model of vaccination. Yeah. Um, but the other part of it is the aspect of the most vulnerable populations, the those who are less educated, less access to healthcare resources, less access to the majority of the um, resources out there now to deal with with, with COVID-19 um, are the ones that are potentially the first to potentially get, I wouldn't say nihilistic or mistrustful or less likely to seek clarity on vaccination science. Yeah. And I think there's a growing number of people that in that regard, uh, which I think is some of the questions that I think uh, Maria is gonna ask later. Maria, should we stop here and let you continue? <laughs> no, just... this is this is very interesting. If you want to keep going, feel free. Um, you already answered a few of my questions, but uh, I guess that if like we can keep going with this kind of uh, train of thought. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, there are kind of these pockets of anti-vaccination sentiments in certain religious communities. Uh, Lima, I think it's really interesting that you pointed out that a lot of it is coming from pressure from outside secular communities um, that are kind of uh, putting pressure on these more insular communities. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the obstacles to uh, promoting facts, I guess, um, in these communities, what are the primary obstacles that you've encountered and how have you navigated that? Um, so I've been in vaccine education since the measles outbreak in the United States in 2019, but a lot has changed with COVID. Um, it's just gotten so much worse. Um, so the obstacles have changed. In general, what we find is that um, information and trust can go a very long way. So one of the ways that I've tried being helpful to my community and people beyond is by just constantly sharing evidence-based information on all of my social media platforms. And almost every one of my posts has a source um, because that's the only way you can engage in conversation. Anyone can post a meme or a screenshot or a fact that they heard from somewhere, but it has no relevance or weight if it's 
not sourced. So everyone knows that if I'm going to share something, I have proof for every single word. You know, um, I've even become a meme, like I'll say like citation, you know, um, you can't just share random, random stuff without, you know, this is too important to share misinformation. So sharing evidence-based information, I think is one really important thing. Um, also being a, a source of trust in the sense that if we don't know something, we need to be honest and say, well, we don't know at this point. Um, you know, because the science has been evolving for the last over two years at this point, people are tired of that. And I keep reminding them that this is one of the first times for most people, most generations, where we're watching the science unfold in real time. And it is so messy and is so challenging. And the guidance keeps changing and guidelines and protocols are changing. And it doesn't mean you're being lied to. It means as we learn more, um, the policies will change to reflect that, you know, masks and, and boosters. As we learn more, we, we can adapt our, our protocols for that. And instead of getting jaded, I mean, you need to, you need to kind of go with the flow right now, but that's challenging for people. Yeah. Oh, that's, def I, that's definitely true. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Singh, go ahead. No, no, no. So please, I would add to that. Um, I think there's been a few factors to answer your question appropriately. Um, I think the biggest piece, as you mentioned, Blima, is the trust aspect. So, but trust has been hard, right? Trust has been hit, hit dead on with changing information, changing so fast. People are like, well, this is not true. This is what I heard. This is what I've been seeing. This is what you're saying. Are you really speaking to me? The religious communities have a different aspect, a challenge, which is unique potentially, is that a lot of us, religion, culture, and silos all intersect in a way that's made information transmission very challenging. Um, from a perspective of, you know, education level, all we have to think about, you know, how our information is given. Is it given at which education level? Who are the most vulnerable people? Is it being revised at a certain amount of time? Is it is those revisions, are they, are they getting out there before the old stuff is still, while the old stuff is still out there? And so the ability to channel um, communication in an effective way that's timely, that's updated, that gets rid of the old stuff as well, has been really challenging, has been fraught with a lot of concerns. Yes. And I think it's challenged us in ways that I think many of us were not prepared for. Um, we've also, I think, had to uh, make sure that we, even though we are from, we represent certain religions, within those religions are subcultures, whether it be language, whether it be styles of communication, dialects, whatever the case might be, generational differences of how to communicate that information. You know, who do you target um, in, those, in those dynamics? Those are a bit challenging to think through. And so I think, um, I'll be honest, we've all, we've all been really challenged with how to do this well and struggling. I saw um, a, a good graphic that was discussing um, how to educate your population on vaccination. And I have a student that was going to work on that uh, for, for a project. And it broke it down to individual conversations initially, and then upgrading to kind of community level uh, conversations, and then kind of like the, 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 the national public health discussion. And I found that it had a lot of success with um, my cancer population during 2020 through 2021, I was kind of the, the nurse practitioner slash clinical supervisor of a chemotherapy suite that primarily served underserved Americans, primarily black and Hispanic, where there are a lot of trust issues um, as well as misinformation coming through from uh, spiritual advisors. I had a lot of patients tell me, well, my minister said this and that there's aborted fetuses in the vaccines and a lot of questions like that. And over the course of several months, I got 99% of my patients vaccinated, but primarily because we have a relationship where they come in weekly or every two weeks for chemotherapy, for injections. I manage their symptoms. We're on the phone all the time. And they have come to a point where they inherently trust me to guide them, to keep them safe and keep them healthy. And despite all their fears, most of them got vaccinated after our discussions. We also had to facilitate those appointments I mean, now I don't even remember that well, but a year ago, if you recall, it was impossible to get appointments anywhere. You needed four browsers open for several pharmacies and vaccination sites. It was harder than getting tickets to Hamilton. You know, it was just, <laughs> it was impossible. Um, and you know what? I had a lot of Jewish volunteers in my circles that said, oh my God, that's not okay. I want your patients vaccinated. And they would make phone calls and sit on computers and get all of my black and Hispanic patients um, vaccinated. And that was so heartwarming for me to see like the community come together that way. But the trust went a long way, but that's not workable. Like you said, Dr. Singh, on like a national level, People just simply don't trust our public health 
um, at the city, state, or federal level anymore. And you know what, I saw an interview with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, and she said that she's going to be undergoing some training for communications to improve how her message comes across. And I'm just thinking now, you know, like, I feel like that ship has sailed so far. And it, it, it it comes down, I think, to the voices within each community, you know, like you, Dr. Singh, within your communities, myself in my Orthodox community, where I receive equal amounts of love and hatred for my for my constant discussion about vaccines, to simply be a voice of reason and science and hopefully lack of judgmentalism to, to help people make, make the decision to get vaccinated or to get boosted or to be careful you know, around immunocompromised people. And that's really what it boils down to, just constantly sharing information and, and hoping people will, will listen with an open ear. No, that's well said. I think it's been really, and it's, we've all been challenged with this. And I think we are going to continue to be challenged with this, especially as this a deep, not mist, well, I would say in some degrees, mistrust or, or dubious as, uh, adoption of science. I think it's been really sort of a, it's been, it's been hitting us all pretty hard. But from a sick religion perspective, though, I was kind of hoping the world religions in general would be a little bit more vocal um, about, you know, pro-vaccination. And we haven't had a, from the sick national um, uh, bodies that are voices, um, haven't had a robust pro-vaccination stance. And that's been a little bit disappointing um, as opposed to like the Pope, for example, or other sort of spiritual leaders that really have come forward and said, we want everyone and their, whoever they can to get be vaccinated as much as possible. Yeah, there've been some people out there who said that, but I think they've been tempered uh, by, certain pressures or certain concerns to potentially not do that. And I'm just curious, what, what are you all seeing? Oh my gosh, I you're, you're hitting on one of the biggest things I've been publicly speaking about, and that is the crisis in leadership within the Jewish community. Um, several very vocal and elderly rabbis in Israel have publicly gotten their vaccines on camera and have consistently endorsed vaccination. The anti-vaxxers will simply say, well, they were fed misinformation, which is both disrespectful to rabbis who you turn to for guidance in every other area. But again, anti-vaxxers will kind of capitalize on anything, whether it's okay or not. Uh, within America, there has been a lot more silence. Uh, there are very large national organizations with considerable lobbying power in Albany, um, in other states, and they have been silent. Um, they have offered prayer. Um, they have said people should ask their doctors what to do. Um, and that's a false message because with public health, you don't ask your doctor what to do. This is not individualized medicine. This is public health where the vaccine is for everybody with very limited exceptions. I, I wrote one vaccine exemption and it was for um, a patient with a refractory ITP and very low platelets. Um, and I gave her a six month exemption to reevaluate that later. So asking your doctor what to do, that, that's a cop out, you know, saying we advise you to follow your doctor's advice because many people found a doctor that said, you don't need it, you're young, you're healthy. So this crisis of leadership has been very demoralizing to myself and to others in my community who feel that had um, health leadership in the community or rabbinical leadership in the community been very vocal, it may have made a difference and brought more trust to these conversations. And they don't want to probably because of the, the the flash, you know, the, the clapback, um, you know, accusations of being political, accusations of killing people, like, and all those things that I get, and no one wants to be attacked for that. And that has been one of the most painful parts of trying to provide guidance as, as a single woman out on the internet, with no gravitas, no strength behind me, no organizational power, when there are so many of those people who could be doing it, but aren't. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think, um, Lima I, and uh, Dr. Singh, I really liked your points about having people in the communities uh, that are kind of advocating for vaccination, are very pro-science, are uh, really dedicated to uh, sharing the truth and sharing the evidence. Um, and I think, uh, like you mentioned, building those trusting uh, provider patient relationships is really, really important uh, for beginning to dismantle some of uh, the misinformation that's out there. Um, but how do we begin to build trust in institutions? Um, because I think that that's more of a, a difficult kind of uh, 
obstacle that we have currently. Um, and it's hard to build faith in institutions uh, when you don't actually see the individuals that kind of compose these institutions. You don't see what their motivations are, what their perspectives are, where they're coming from. Um, and I think that mistrust of institutions is one of the major issues right now is that uh, there people feel like they don't have any reason uh, to trust uh, the governmental institutions that are uh, issuing different recommendations every week or um, don't have reason to trust uh, pharmaceutical companies that are producing the vaccine. Uh, so what are your ideas about um, kind of combating that kind of um, mistrust? That's a, I'm not a social scientist or a psychologist of any sort. Um, so I can just tell you that, you know, this is a going to be a very important social science question. I think we're all going to be seeing and we're going to be studying the devast the devastating effects of of COVID on is organ organizations, institutions, as you uh, as you address that, um, particularly related to um, it becomes it sort of builds on itself because we all went to lockdown, for example, for a while, the institutional fabric um, dissolved a little bit, even further. And so I think until we are back in person and developing relationships, developing team, developing trust amongst our, our, our entire congregations and such, or whoever we, we used to interact with, it's gonna be a bit of a struggle along that to, to get uh, some trust back. Now, I do think uh, back to um, Ablima's earlier comment about data, about getting the science, getting the sources and just keep, pushing the data, I think the numbers, and then being trustful. Part of being trustful though, isn't necessarily just you know hitting people over the head. It's trying to understand a lot of people are just uncertain. They just don't know. They have a lot of fears and those fears are being stoked by various other you know, people with, various, with, with different interests. And so I think just understanding their fears is a big part of it. And I think a lot of us have been not trained to do that. We were trained in some things, don't get me wrong, as a physician or as a nurse practitioner, you might be you're trained for certain things, don't get me wrong. But this level of mistrust, I think very few of us have ever actually seen or understood uh, to the point of potentially, you know, people, you know, um, have attacked, you know, their healthcare providers, for example. I mean, physical assault and abuse on a scale that we haven't seen in this country. And so that's just a reflection of, this erosion that you're that, that you're describing. So how are we going to get that back? Well, we probably need to get specific training on how to understand that. We probably need a more dedicated strategies towards and tactics towards developing that trust from every organization, every institution. We probably need to get you know such patients or community representatives on our uh, get some feedback. Be proactive. We need to be proactive as well, understanding their concerns and getting ahead of it. I, I do a lot of social media work now, not because I want to spend my free time. I'd rather read, read a book or, you know, watch TV or something relaxing or, um, uh, and, but I end up spending my time on social media just because I have to, if I don't do it, nobody else is doing it. And the other people that have time to do it, who I don't trust to give the right information out there are out there. And, fee and so this aspect of thinking through how do we communicate today in a modern world moving forward, I think we need to, we need to retrain a little bit of how and re-engineer some of those systems to build back that trust. Um, I wanna add to that. And forgive me if my thoughts are a little rambled because I want to comment on what Dr. Singh said. And then I also want to comment as to your, your, your question a little more separately as to how to build trust in institutions. So uh, to answer that first, I kind of try to respond to people's direct criticism of that. So when they say it's all about the money, I point out that vaccines are about $50 in injection, whereas monoclonal antibodies are $2,000 in infusion. So within the Orthodox community, people have been very quick to kind of organize themselves and have monoclonal antibodies available because their treatment is well pre-Omicron. They're less effective with Omicron, but pre-Omicron, they reduce hospitalization by 70%. So as people in the community got sick, they would get monoclonal antibodies and Regeneron and be well. So they were saying, well, if we have therapeutics. Why are we focusing only on vaccines? And I said, well, Talk to me about the economics of that. Do you really believe that the government should be spending $2,000 per person to treat them when we can give them vaccines for $50 or $100 for all three shots? And that kind of stops everyone in their tracks because now the money conversation makes no sense anymore because who's footing the bill for either the monoclonal antibodies 
or the vaccines. It goes back to the government. So these mistrustful points that people make, I kind of like to turn them over on their head and remind them that it's actually not the way they seem. Like, I'm just going to use an example, but when I talk to people about autism and the connection to vaccines because they don't trust the government, um, and I tell them, well, Autism costs the government about $120 billion a year in services for these people. Do you really think the government would keep vaccinating children with a vaccine that may cause autism if they're also footing the bill for that $120 billion it costs to give people with autism the services they need to be part of society? They don't think of it that way. So kind of reminding them that the, the financial incentive that they think is there is actually not really there that way. Um, so addressing those issues sometimes help people reframe their conspiracy thoughts about who to trust. Mm -hmm. But in general, if someone told me something that I unfortunately am jaded enough to now believe, people are good, institutions are evil. Um, I mean, ultimately, I find that the individuals that are persevering on social media or in their communities, constantly making time that they don't have to have these conversations on the individual level, they're really doing the good work out there. The, in the, the institutions are so much less effective. And that's, I think, where the challenge is. Um, I don't have the answer to that. I, I do know that in a pinch, there's no atheist in a foxhole. And ultimately, even the anti-vaxxers, the rabid anti-vaxxers are showing up at the hospital when they're that sick. You know, and I just really hope that as people can realize that we, nurses are not killing patients and doctors are not ventilating patients who don't need it. Um, all those fallacies and lies, I really hope that as they encounter the healthcare system for other reasons, whether they have a cancer diagnosis or a child with an illness or anything, they realize that you can trust your healthcare provider um, and that this erosion that happened during COVID, I hope. I hope it doesn't continue to 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 go down the way the way it has been because that's it's it's very difficult for healthcare providers right now to realize that. Hey Marie, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. We do. Uh, I was just going to mention that um, before we do, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, mainly touching back on your point about uh, communication, Dr. Singh, I think that. Uh, right now, especially in a post-COVID world, we are really limited in the pathways that we have to connect with other people and have conversations. And unfortunately, a lot of that is limited uh, to interacting with people online, which as we already know, is just rife with misinformation and all kinds of pollution. Um, so I think that uh, you talking about going on social media, finding these pathways that we do have available to share, uh, to share the truth, to share information, to share knowledge, um, even just to share perspectives, I think that's important. Uh, finding people where they are and having those conversations uh, and finding new pathways of connection, I think is really important. Um, but yes, we do have a few questions so I can ask and then you can both take the opportunity to answer. Uh, we have a question from one of our advisory council members, Dr. Like, uh, have any epidemiological statistics been reported relating COVID-19 vaccinations rate, vaccination rates stratified across different religious faith-based groups, similar to what is being done across age, race, ethnic groups? Uh, you should both be able to view the questions in the Q&A box. Oh, if you don't mind, I'll take that first. Um, this is a very challenging statistic. That's a great, excellent question uh, about the idea of statistics. The problem is, you know, if you're breaking down, you can look at a, a whole crowd of people and not deter, and you can maybe make some inferences related to um, demographics of age, gender, rate, race, um, maybe, maybe, big, big qualified maybe there. Um, but religion is different. Right, because it spans it spans ethnicity, it spans skin color, it spans all kinds of things, and people are very personal. And often, either we don't ask them to share that, or we just simply that's an area that's not comfortable. So we don't have a lot. Now we do have some very interesting social experiments, however, internationally. So Israel, for example, having a very obviously a very strong, <laughs> very dominant Jewish population, uh, predominantly, um, where they had a social policy related to vaccinations. And so what have we learned from that actually? Well, actually Israel was extraordinarily effective at this last, at this last variant in terms of Omicron. Um, yes, it had a little bit of a spike in the beginning, but the, the devastation was not nearly what earlier waves such as the Delta wave or other waves have done into that country. And so I think if you can infer that social experiment 
across the entire in the country, many people look at Israel as potentially having some aspects to model around the world. Now, in India, where where my family my ancestors are from, um, unfortunately. Part, there are parts of the world that just didn't have access to good vaccines early on in the pandemics. And so simply it was an access issue. Um, and so we haven't been able to see how other racial or international um, uh, factors play out. Um, but it will be very, once we have an access issue that's hopefully overcome in the next few, in the next year or two, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to answer that question a lot better. Um, sorry, I was unmuting myself. I have seen a little bit of data um, probably done across communities, not like on the national scale, looking at whether different religions have higher rates of vaccination. Um, I did see that for Judaism, it was stratified by uh, sub segments of Judaism and the more religious groups, the Orthodox, the ultra Orthodox had lower rates of vaccination. Whereas as you move more kind of mainstream left wing, um, more Americanized, if you will, the rates were much higher, which is entirely expected. Um, so I, I know that the zip code I live in has some of the lowest vaccination rates, unfortunately. I think it's about 45% of the community is vaccinated and that's pretty low. Now there are yeah, and I would just add to that there are some so some some denominations like the uh, Mormons or the um, Amish who have certain statistics that suggest of various different vaccination rates, but I don't have that data in front of me, so I don't want to speak to that specifically. But it's just not broadly available. And the second question uh, is: What religious-based strategies have you found helpful in dealing with vaccine hesitant or vaccine uncertain? Uh, versus anti-vax patients. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I really I I try to avoid the term anti-vax to be honest with you, just because it seems to be that most people are of the former terms, which are vaccine hesitant and vaccine uncertain. And I think the majority of people are in that space. Don't get me wrong. There are many people that are there are many people that are still anti-vaccination regardless. But I think a lot of the people who are vaccine hesitant or vaccine uncertain respond to probably several principles. First is kindness and genuine concern or compassion. I think as long as we show compassion, understanding that we are trying to educate them or we're trying to help them understand their best choices, not decide for them, recognizing that they have choices and the choices um, can lead to certain consequences. And um, unfortunately, that's just the nature of life, right? You make a choice, <laughs> no matter what you do, and there's a consequence to that. And so just sort of educating them about the consequences and helping them see um, has been helpful. I think from a religious-based strategy, I think we do focus on things like, um, I think Blima mentioned earlier, history. None of us have ever seen, and in all, our, in all, our, in all the major world religions, there have been, epi there, there have been times of great suffering, there have been times of great prosperity. And so trying to draw historical aspects to the religious heritage, you might say, can be very helpful to influence people along those lines. And so you kind of draw on those experiences. Next, you draw on people who are, who are more aligned to scripture of, of whatever race or, or religion that is. And so you sort of look, looked and say, what does that person respond to? Or they may be more of a cultural um, um, connection there, re less religious. And so trying to understand what people connect with, really seeing them per se, seeing their concerns, seeing their hesitancy, and then trying to figure out, okay, based on their personality and why they're hesitant and why they're uncertain, can we potentially lead them to make the choice that we think would most benefit them and their communities? That's generally our principles. Um, do you have to be more forceful, for example? Sure, a lot of us had where our, where our institution said, you know what, you're not allowed back until you've had a vaccine card or you've had a vaccination. Um, some people have made that choice um, to sort of more force that aspect. And that's been done in, in obviously non-religious areas as well, including the healthcare system I work in was vaccines are mandatory. And so that's just a, a way of, of, doing, of doing that as well. But I think the other part that's religious based, we don't say it's religion, but religion is part of a, um, they all live in communities. Communities have generations. So caring for elderly people, caring for younger people. I think showing them the value of being vaccine, being vaccinated is not about you. It's actually about the community in which you're in. 
yes, it's religious uh, influence or in undertones there, obviously, um, or overtones, but clearly that's an important part of the, your life and what, what matters to you. So make it easier for yourself, make it easier for your family and your loved ones, and go ahead and get vaccinated. So those are the strategies that we generally do, but it starts with compassion. Um, I think Dr. Singh nailed all of that. And what I general in my interactions on social media, I'm generally just blasting out to the internet and, you know, uh, not tailoring my response, particularly just sharing thoughts that I think are important, whether it's data. Um, but I also do share a lot of um, religious themed concepts, whether it's um, screenshots of rabbinical writings from the 1600s or something that a rabbi in the 1800s commanded during an epidemic when he demanded that synagogue participation can have no more than 15 people at a time. Now, this is this goes back to the 1800s. And I'm like, look at that. They're limiting prayer uh, to small groups back in the 1800s. Why are people so averse to that in 2020? So sharing examples of how this is not new, um, of how the rabbis have guided us in the past on that, as well as the laws of, of Judaism, which are to care about your neighbor, which are to do the right thing, to not contribute to disease, so in my public interactions, where which I don't tailor particularly, I use all of those examples. But as Dr. Singh said, to know your audience, that's where I bring that into play in all the private messages I get. And there are hundreds or at this point, probably thousands of those where people will say, well, I don't know if I should vaccinate my 11 year old. I don't know if I should vaccinate, you know, my grandma. Um, she's old. She's frail. Should she get the vaccine? That's when I take into consideration Who's approaching me? What do I know about them? How can I guide them more, um, more appropriately? And that's when I can be a lot more nuanced and tailored. But yes, I use all of the methods that Dr. Singh mentioned in terms of um, uh, appealing to community, because that's a really big thing. Jewish people in the religious community is a very tight knit. We live in urban, dense areas where you don't have a choice but to think about others. You know, um, and I often bring my experiences as a cancer provider where patients are fearful. I mean, some studies have recently shown that even boosted cancer patients still have a mortality rate of 13% when it comes to COVID. That's really high. So reminding people that you don't know who you live among, you don't know who has a diagnosis, you don't know, you might be fine with COVID, you probably will be fine. COVID is overwhelmingly safe for most people, but you don't know who it won't be safe for. And those are kind of the messages I keep reminding, which is basically what Dr. Singh said. Yeah, and I think model modeling that for everybody. So when my kids and I got vaccinated, we put it on out there. We let them everybody know. We celebrated it, you know, and being and being and framing it in a way that this is in concordant with our spiritual backing. That this is our is our this is our background. This is our beliefs, and we frame it in a way that is religiously constructed. Um, and we justify it that way. And I think that tends to resonate with different crowds. And if they see you as acting in everyone's best interest, not a selfish interest, I think people can read that. Um, the people are smart. They're <laughs> much as they've been influenced by a lot of other things. They can oftentimes pick up who's acting in their interest, who they know. And so I think that's the ultimate thing is, you know, gr at the grassroots level, just be the, do the best you can at your, at your local level. So taking the conversation in a little bit of a different direction, um, because you are both healthcare providers, um, I thought it would be a good question uh, to ask when you do encounter a patient uh, that is vaccine hesitant or is opposed to vaccines entirely for what they identify as a religious objection, uh, how do you navigate or respond to that issue? I'll take that first. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's challenging because there is no religious objection to vaccination in Judaism. So it's unfortunate. Many people will use the religious exemption, but dishonestly, um, some people say, well, there's uh, fetal tissue in the vaccine or, uh, I don't know, um, pig cells or something that are, you know, non-kosher. So people will often kind of create a reason why they feel like it's against their religion. But in actuality, they'll just say, well, it's unsafe and therefore my religion doesn't let me do anything unsafe, which then leads us to the conversation where they need to tell me why they believe it's unsafe. Um, and then that just delves into the whole, uh, you know, 
reports and anecdotes that they're hearing from people where people are sick after the vaccine and dropping dead immediately after the vaccine. So it, it becomes pretty challenging when they talk about religious exemptions simply because there's not much of a conversation to be held because it's based on a false premise. At least that's how it is for, for us. Yeah, so you're. Ex I think from the if another sick came to me and asked me for religious exemption, I think I'd have a really hard time. And I think they probably wouldn't come to me because they know I'm pretty at, pro at, I'm pretty vocal about my stance. So uh, I can't say I have a lot of experience on that on that on, in that in that regard. Um, I will tell you, people were vaccine hesitant, um, and we just had to educate them and sort of talk with them through that and you know, the stuff we've already talked about. When it comes to other faiths, taking care of other people from other faiths who have vaccine hesitancy, I be honest with you, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this quite a bit. Um, so I work in critical care, I work as a pulmonologist, so I work in the clinics, I work in the hospital, I work in the intensive care units, and I also work on tele in the, what's called the telecritical care unit, where we provide care to other places around the country and the region. And it's been a very interesting experience watching people who um, you know, are vehemently opposed to vaccination, yet are vehemently fighting for their loved one's life and upset as anything that their loved one is so sick and why are we not doing anything about it per se. And it's been hard to watch. It's been hard to experience and it's been traumatic for not just myself, but all our colleagues across healthcare. I mean, the nurses, what they take, I, I, I give them unbelievable credit of fa facing this head on of people who say on the one, th on the one side, our religious, our, our religion tells us not to get vaccinated, but our religion will allow advanced life forms of life support. And in fact, you better give this to me or including experimental treatments. And that paradox has been extraordinarily difficult to navigate and it's been a source of frustration. And I will say burnout for a lot of our healthcare workers that there's this, there's this dichotomy. You don't, you believe that your, your being, your supreme being does not want you to be vaccinated but you believe your supreme being also gives you the right to then take that same logic and apply it to even more experimental treatments, which are antibody-based therapies or things that are less studied, less resource available, and much more expensive and much more risky. So I think we need a call to action from major leaders around the world, spiritual leaders as well, that we need to tell them, call it what it is. This is not truth. This is actually a complete, this is a very big concern that a lot of us have, that this re reconciliation of logic is just incredibly hard. Now, there are people that are obviously afraid to have that conversation for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of backlash, there's a lot of political concerns about these types of conversations. But I will say it, that it's affecting me, it doesn't affect me. I will take care of that person regardless. We will take care of them. We will take, we will give them the best care possible, regardless of who, of who they are and what their beliefs are when they come to see us. That's not an issue. But the larger picture being, how do we do better with this? Because this cannot come, this is, cannot continue. Um, we can't afford it as a society, economically, socially is having major, major ramifications. And I think it's not fair to the families and all those who suffer, the kids who've been orphaned, the elderly fa family, uh, elderly people that have been abandoned because of these, of these decisions. It's been really hard to watch. And so I'm hopeful that people will actually look at this very critically and hopefully have more of a voice. Yeah, I have to say, um, just by the nature of my work, I talk to a lot of people who are either religious leaders or religiously motivated actors in their communities. And I found that uh, it's definitely the consensus uh, that it is a community responsibility um, and that prioritizing the life, your life, your family's life, the life of your friends, the life of the other people in your community is of the utmost importance. And I, uh, I wish that that was a conversation that we were hearing uh, more often. Um, so another question I have, um, and I think this, uh, I mean, I have my own thoughts about this and I think uh, I will, I'll let you in on them in a second, uh, but going back to institutions for a moment, uh, are there any ways that you can see, for example, the CDC or other governmental organizations or agencies, uh, how can they, uh, presence themselves in the communities that are experiencing uh, vaccine hesitancy? How can, um, 
how can they engage and connect with these communities a little bit better? Um, I think I'll, I'll answer that. I'll take that first shot at this. I think um, the CDC has struggled mightily in terms of um, the um, public perception. Um, I'm a huge fan of the CDC. I will just say it up front. I think they do phenomenal work, but I think the messaging has somehow been not well done in the last couple of years. Um, I do think there needs, needs to be more intentional effort related to cultural specific, um, really targeting vulnerable populations um, and information in a timely manner from trustworthy sources. And rather than just putting a guideline out there and expecting everyone to adopt to them, potentially changing that strategy might be helpful. And I'm just brainstorming. I don't know how resource intensive that is, but a lot of us have thought that, you know, we felt that a little bit out of touch, that the CDC feels a little bit out of touch with our life. And that's the, that's the feedback we're hearing from our, from our people. And that CDC is there and we're here. And how do we get the disconnect? How do we minimize the disconnect? Whether it be local chapters, local organizations, whether it be more robust communication channels. I mean, virtual technology now has never been as good as it is today. So I think the CDC on other organizations that are authoritative in this regard and are meaning to be helpful, probably need to spend some time thinking of the psychology, the behavioral aspects of how to do the right thing easily in a customized way, the, ba the, bread, and base the, the bread and butter of what many psychologists do really well, which I'm just not a psychologist, so I will defer that to those who are much better at this than I am. Um, I, I think I think this is really challenging because right now, at least in my community, no one wants to see the CDC and they don't want to hear from the DOH. Um, they, there's just there there's there's no room for reparations at this time um, or, or fixing these these lines of communication. Um, Any everyone thinks that once the DOH has a say in something, it's compromised financially and by government interests and politics. So it's it's really troubling. What I wish we would have received throughout the two years is at, at least support the communities, even if they if, even if their presence is not desired. The amount of misinformation and funding that's going into the misinformation, because fear produces funding, and everyone in my community believes that they're mandating children's vaccines any day, and that they're going to round you up, and people are buying guns. So the amount of fear being propagated by that causes people to open their wallets. While all the vaccinated people aren't really vocal because they got their shots, they're going about their lives, you know, they're not donating anywhere. So I walk the streets of my community and I see misinformation signs advertising webinars with um, Robert Malone and, uh, you know, other anti-vaccine spokespeople that will be warning more and more people within my community of all the false dangers of vaccination. And I have not a dollar to combat that. So there's a flood of misinformation that is very well funded. It is found on everyone's WhatsApp channels, social media channels, and physical huge signs across the kosher groceries in my neighborhoods and everywhere else. Whereas if I wanted to host the webinar, I don't have any of that money to advertise it and to promote it. So if they would give us those resources and let us battle our own fight in a way, you know, give us your support. You've got a lot of providers here who care about their communities, are well equipped to respond to them and provide them with information. Um, just, just help us help them. I, that would have gone very far, but we're just kind of screaming into the void over here without that kind of support. That's been very dis dis disappointing to so many of us. Right, like the same approach related to community health workers that many organizations have done. I think we need to leverage the utility and the influence of spiritual leaders um, in that regard. That that has been the, the most difficult and painful part for myself and for most of us, where we're looking towards our leadership and their silence. And there's no way to understand it other than their reluctance to step into such polarized discourse. And it's not forgivable. Yeah. There's a nice question in the chat, uh, Maria. I don't know if you saw that one. Yes. So additional question. Given the increasing rates of compassion fatigue, burnout, and moral injury among healthcare providers and other staff, what religious and spiritual strategies have been helpful to you and your colleagues on the front lines in coping? 
Well, I'll start because I would say um, spiritual coping, I guess, is part, I mean, coping is what I think a lot of us go to religion for in the first place, right? We go to their our religious aspects. So if internally in the Sikh religion, meditation, mindfulness training, the idea of potentially experiencing oneness in the world, that's inherent to our religion. So from that perspective, it's been, we've been actually relying on our religion to deal with all the stress. I rely on it heavily on a personal basis to deal with the, some of the horrors I watch in the intensive care unit, for example, or in the clinics when I watch people try to make it back from this devastating illness. So I do reflect a lot. I try to try to shut the noise out and deal with things on a personal basis. And so religion has been very helpful. Um, so that I think a lot of religions share that idea of spirituality. On the same token, that helps you connect with other people. Uh, what I think COVID, on the positive side of the pandemic, I think a lot of us have recognized the importance of gratitude, of the importance of connectivity, the importance of that, you know what, we aren't here alone and that we suffer alone. Um, we are much, we thrive when we're with other people, for many of us. And I think that aspect of seeing this being able to connect with others on a spiritual basis, on a religious basis, including in our, you know, churches, temples, synagogues, whatever it is, the house of worship that you have, um, that's extraordinarily important. Now, we do miss a lot of that because of the, you know, uh, the restrictions that have been imposed, but I think we're starting to see newer ways of connecting. 